it's about a two hour drive uh, and halfway there I'll stop to get a cup of coffee and have a break. A bit overcast but it'll probably be a nice day. the mess that I left the boat in when I uh, when I left last time because I just put the mast up and I had to get home so the problem I want to work on today is I want to make sure that the mast rigging is correct in the end <coughs> Last time there were five of us putting the rigging up. Uh, sorry, last time there were five of us to put the mast up. We had to pull the boat out a little bit from this fence at the back here. Um, and it's quite a heavy mast. So we rigged it and a towards the end it was a little bit in a hurry. And I want to make sure that everything's in the right place because putting the boat in the water or putting the boat on the sea and then finding out that something's not in the right place is not the best idea. So today my job is to make sure all of the ropes are in the right place to do the right things. Now I know for a fact that something's in the wrong place. I just don't know exactly what it is because I had to take a, a thing off a thing and put on a different thing. So I shouldn't have had to do that. So let me see if I can figure it out. I need to change out of my uh, clean clothes and into my work clothes. The last time I made the mistake of keeping my good shirt on, it got covered in white paint. So. Well, I've just about managed to, I think I've rigged the ropes the right way. I'll show you in a minute all the bits and pieces. I'm having some lunch right now. I'll, make, I'll show you first and then I'll have some lunch. This is the end of the boom. And the boom goes along to the mast. And this is the, this here is the boom. And this here on top of it is called the gaff. Now, this is, this kind of boat is a gaff rigged boat. Oh, I need someone to love me. Oh, I need someone to love me. Oh, I need someone to love me. So 
So I think that I've got everything more or less in the right place. But you know how it is with do-it-yourself furniture, okay? I've got this halyard here, spare, because when we put the, the mast up, we forgot to rig it to bring up the second sail. It's fine, I'm not going to use the second sail. I don't know if I'm that experienced that I want to have you know, more than two sails at any one time. Anyway, I'm going to have a spot of lunch right now. And then I might think about putting the sails on. The trouble is, the boat's stationary, obviously because it's sitting on a trailer right now, and the wind is blowing, really it's blowing this way. And I really want the wind to be blowing in my, in my face when I put the sail on, because it's quite a big mainsail. I think it's like 265 square feet. And with, this, with these big wooden spars, if it gets away from me, it's like mm, too much bother. I might put it on and I'll, I, well, I'll see. I'll see how <laughs> adventurous I feel. It's got to go on at some point anyway. So time for a spot of lunch. Egg and cress sandwich. Bag of crisps. Flask of tea. Beat a cup of tea. I'm going to go exploring in a minute after I've had my sandwich. I love boatyards because they're full of, of like mystery in a sense. I love boats that look like they've been a bit derelict or neglected. Because you think to yourself, this thing has you know quite a bit of intrinsic value, and yet there it is, neglected, sitting for years and then you know, rotting away. And I think to myself, what sort of backstory do these things have? And it also makes me realise that boats and boating is like an interesting, really interesting metaphor for many of the things that I talk about in terms of psychology. You know, a boat needs to be looked after. I'm here looking after my boat, my little boat here working on it. I'm taking a day to work on it. It'll take a couple more days of work to finish it before it can be put in the water. I'll have it craned in the water. It's too big for me to manage myself. Um, but it requires, it requires work, it requires maintenance. And you know, anything that gets neglected, in a sense, gets forgotten. And if we neglect things, and it's like external things, if we neglect you know, external elements like a boat or a car or a house or maintenance on whatever thing you've got. If we neglect that, it's akin to neglecting ourselves because we are the product that we live in. You know, our body is the, the vehicle of our mind, let's say. And if you neglect it, then it eventually breaks down. Now it's got massive resilience, so you know, you're good for quite a long time. The trouble is, you know, time passes and eventually you get to the point where the neglect becomes something which is causing you trouble. And as I get older, I'm aware of, you know, I'm a bit stiffer, I'm a little bit less able, I'm a little bit less, a little bit less fit, and I'm a little bit less strong than I used to be. And so, you know, it's, it's, it, we're like boats, really. We've got to just pay attention and continue to do the routine maintenance. It would have been a nice boat. There's always something attractive, mysterious, adventurous, you know, like a childhood mystery about old boats. And I always think this one's quite interesting. This corner of the boatyard is where boats come to die, I think. 
It has some company. I think these boats here are also come to die. It's a Cornish Shrimper 19, which I guess means it's more or less the same length as my little boat. Same basic idea. This is a Drascom, a big open boat. I'm going to take you for a walk into Bosom, which is a little village in West Sussex. And it's where I keep my little boat and it's where the boat gets launched. So I was going to give you a little look. Now Bosom is quite a famous place because it, it captures the story of King Canute. And I also think William the Conqueror, well, I'm a little bit less certain about that. So let's, let's have a look at Bosom. All of this will be underwater in about two hours. So I found a quiet spot. Um, I've broken my tripod so I'm holding this by hand so I hope it's not too wobbly. Uh, quiet spot. So this is Bosom. Um, I've let you have a little look around the area. I'm sitting here at the end of this wall and so this house here and this land here, well this all of this land here will be underwater shortly and this harbour, this wall here protects this house and as you can see that's quite a nice house. Uh, if I was to jump down there I will be even more protected from noise, etc, etc. And this is the view that I have sitting here. All the little boats. And all of this, all of this, dries out <coughs> onto a mud flat. Dries out onto a mud flat at low water. So. Bosom, quite a famous place. Apparently, King Canute, the famous, I think, Viking, tried to hold back the sea here. It's a famous story in English history, so if you're not uh, familiar with it, King Canute tried to hold back the sea here. And also, in 1064, Earl Harold, who later became King Harold, sailed from here to Normandy to negotiate with William, Duke of Normandy. So Harold became King Harold, and William, Duke of Normandy, became William the Conqueror when he beat Harold in 1066 at the Battle of Hastings, which I guess is up the road to some degree. So, <clears throat> I've come down to work on the little boat, and I was driving down, it's quite a long drive, and I was thinking, okay, so what's the most meaningful thing that I could say to make this trip worthwhile to fix the mast and the rigging and everything, but also to make it useful to you? And I thought to myself, and I thought to myself, well, if you're at sea and you don't have a chart, you're basically lost. So what's the equivalent to a human chart? And it's almost like, and you could sort of say it's almost like, like a self-image. It's like a, a map of who you are in the world. And if you have a, a faulty marine chart, you're gonna end up getting lost. 
and if you have a faulty self-image you're going to end up getting lost and I think there's probably nothing more valuable than thinking about what your self-image is and modifying it if it needs to be corrected because it's not giving you the experience you want. Your self-image basically is what you think about yourself. It can be in pictures, it can be in stories that you tell yourself, it can be in words that you say, but in principle your self-image is everything because if your self-image is flawed or faulty you will end up doing things commensurate in line with your self-image which will be flawed and faulty and that's not going to give you a good experience. Now it seems to me that our brain is really quite focused on negative things because probably negative things make more sense to focus on because if things go normally things go well you just don't think about them but it's really easy for us to take this idea that we focus on negative things and just to amplify it too much right so that your fault your, your self-image becomes contaminated with negativity your you are the same as everybody else. I don't care what problem you struggle with, you're the same as everybody else. But how you define yourself in your self-image makes things that you struggle with worse or it makes things that you struggle with less problematic, less troublesome. So the metaphor that I'm working on right now is this. Life is a journey, like a boat journey. The journey itself is the object of the exercise because we, you know, we reach many destinations in a boat but whenever you go somewhere you want to go somewhere else and in life we don't really want to reach the destination too soon but we want to have a good journey to have a good journey in a boat you need an accurate chart to have a good journey in life you need an accurate useful self-image it's no point there's absolutely no point in living your life with an unhelpful faulty errorful problematic self-image because if you do that you're only ever going to have the experience of things going wrong, unhappiness, sadness, anxiety certainly, and loss. Now, it's quite a privilege, I think, to be able to go to sea. I have always been interested in being at sea and being in the sea, and I, I have, you know, I've had boats in the past, and I've used to do a lot of scuba diving, and I was even a professional diver for quite a few years. So I love being in and around the water, just the smell of the salt. Of course, I live in Reading, which is about as far from the sea as you can get. Anyway, it's quite a privilege to go to sea. If I was to imagine that going to sea was extremely dangerous, and of course, there is some risk in going to sea, I'm not, I'm not denying that. But if I was to imagine that it was extremely dangerous, I just wouldn't do it. It just wouldn't make sense because I'm imagining it being quite catastrophic. And oh gosh, we might sink. And of course, boats do sink. We might sink, we might get into accidents, we might drown, all sorts of terrible things might happen. So if I was to allow that catastrophic kind of imagination to be my map, to be incorporated into my self-image, I would be averse, I'd be risk averse. I'd be intolerant of uncertainty. Because of course there's always some uncertainty going to sea. There's always some uncertainty when you put yourself out into the environment. But I think it's a privilege to be able to go to sea because it's a privilege to be able to to exercise skills and to be out in the environment. I think going out to sea in a little boat is even more adventurous than camping or, or wild camping as they call it, you know. You're actually out there. I mean, you're not far away. You could be out here. You're actually not far away from land. Certainly not in Chichester where we are now. In fact, just over there, where I have my, where I have my mooring, just on the other side of this spit, this quay, I've, I've camped out there at night on the little boat. So we've put a tent over the boom and it feels really, you know, it feels really adventurous just camping out on the mud in the little boat with a tent on top. So it's, it's a privilege to get away from the shore. Okay, so how do I manage the risk? How do I manage the idea that it is inherently somewhat risky? It's certainly more risky going out on the sea than it is, let's say, driving on the motorway or anything like that. Well, what we do is we we internalize the risk. Instead of allowing the risk to be outside of us, we bring the risk inside of us. So you might say it's risky going to sea. And yeah, sure, fair enough, that has some validity. On the other hand, we might say, yeah, but I'm competent and therefore the risk is minimized because I'm competent at doing what I do. 
And if that's a valid thing to say, I've minimized the risk and I haven't changed the actual environment one bit. I've simply changed how I think about it. Now, if I didn't know how to sail or if I wasn't familiar with the water and, and seamanship, then it would be much more risky going on the water. But I minimize the risk by increasing my competence. So I internalize the risk and then minimize it by increasing my competence. The mistake, <coughs> the mistake a lot of people make is to assume that the environment is risky, whatever they're doing is risky. It's risky driving, it's risky flying, it's risky walking out of the front door if you're agoraphobic. <coughs> and they let, the, they let the risk in the environment be the determining factor. When you internalize the risk, and let's say with agoraphobia, right, I'm frightened of leaving the front door. Yeah, okay, you may feel that you're frightened of leaving the front door, but how many times have you left the front door? Tens of thousands. Okay, so your brain's overestimating the threat. And so we come back to the idea of managing, uh, of, of understanding and managing our self-image, our internal map of experience. And so that instead of simply looking at something and saying, that's really frightening, there's nothing I can do about it. We can say, actually, hang on, I've done this 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 times. And in fact, nothing's happened. Therefore, I can recognize that my brain's overestimating the threat. And I actually am safe. So when I go to sea on my little boat, I can say there is some risk. I watch the weather forecast. I have the necessary you know, safety equipment, life vests and everything. And I have competence and some skill. I'm not a massively skillful sailor by any means, but I have some competence and some skill sufficient to the task. Therefore, the risk is minimized. The risk is as low as it can be. And then I can enjoy the privilege of being on the sea because I'm not allowing the sea and its inherent risk to determine what I'm able to do. It would be the same if you were flying a private airplane or all these kids, look at them here. They're all dinghy sailing. <coughs> this is Bosom Sailing Club uh, that I used to be a member of. And all these kids here are probably members of the sailing club. And they're all learning to sail and they're all racing. That little boat there, that's their safety boat. And they're learning to be on the water, they're learning to sail, they're learning to be in the natural environment. And because they're learning how to do it, their confidence in themselves is increasing. And I think that's the critical thing, okay? We minimize the risk by internalizing the risk and internalizing it means that we do what we can do, we recognize our skills and resources and we be the person that we are and we don't distort our internal map and say, but I can't do anything. I'm helpless, I'm hopeless. It's a risky thing to drive, it's a risky thing to sail, so therefore it's too risky and I can't do anything. We mitigate that risk by managing our skills and our resources and by actually recognizing that many things have an element of risk to them, but the risk is small and the value of doing them is so great that it nourishes the soul. So look at these kids out here. They're just heading out there with their little boats. We've got the appropriate safety equipment on. We've got a safety boat. And in a managed environment, they're learning to be on the water, which is a great privilege. And that's true of everything that you do in life. You equip yourself with the skills that you need and you already have them for virtually everything that you're going to do and you recognize that you have much more competence much more efficacy than you feel if you feel anxious or panicky or whatever so i hope you find this interesting please like it subscribe share that duck does not find this interesting That other duck recognized that that duck was disturbing my audio and is a bit of a fan, so he chased her off. So, I hope you find this interesting. Please subscribe, please like it, please share it. And recognize that how you think about yourself is virtually everything in how you live your life. And you only get the one journey and you are equipped inherently to do virtually anything that you want to do. 
but you can only, if you have a, an accurate map, it helps. If you have an inaccurate internal self-image map, that's just going to make life difficult. Now look how much the water's come in since I've been talking. Here in Bosom, the tide can come up five or six meters and because it's very, very flat, it comes up really fast. So you have to be careful. Mind you, it's not like you can walk on the mud. It's extraordinarily deep and sticky. You simply can't walk on it. So it's not like you can get stuck in the middle of nowhere with the tide coming in. Thanks for taking the time to watch and listen in Bosom, West Sussex.